Living Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity helps over 2 million medical professionals. We are the largest medical network that includes over 80% of physicians and over 50% of physician assistants and nurse practitioners. We don't take that responsibility lightly and committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. If you want to learn more about Doximity, check out your app store at D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. That's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate, and whoo, man, let me tell y'all something right now, okay? Let me just, let me go and keep it a thousand with you, you know? When Emery was born, I tried to kind of keep y'all in the loop, right? I was like, oh, I'm a new father. I'm so excited, all that kind of stuff, and I was talking about it all the time, because I had time, right? It was just me, my wife, and Emery. Now, I got the second girl coming any day, all right? And I don't know if I'm going to be really giving y'all a bunch of live updates, you know what I mean? I'm probably going to be recording all this stuff in advance, Okay, let me tell you the truth, because it's too tiring, right? I got this newborn, a toddler, and my wife, you know what I mean? And and it's the holidays. Listen, let me just tell y'all right now. All the new parents, all the working parents, especially parents who became parents in the pandemic, a lot of peas. I my prayers are with y'all. Okay. I personally pray for y'all on a uh, a fairly ba- a fairly regular basis, not a periodic basis. I'm thinking of another P. I'm trying to freestyle. Anywho, listen. I am excited. Welcome to Living Corporate. I'm excited about uh, the show that we have for you today. I'm excited about Shanisha White. Dr. Shanisha White is a lot of different things, uh, but she's also a host on Living Corporate Network. And from time to time, she brings on guests and they have really dope conversations. This is the conversation you're going to hear this week talking about equity and justice within Web 3.0. Web 3.0 is here to stay. But what does it look like to make sure that we're being as inclusive and equitable as possible? That's the question. That's the question. That's going to continue to be the question as capitalism continues to morph and shift and change because capitalism is built off of exploiting other people. Uh, Capitalism sees folks as dollar signs and figures and not as like the actual lived experience or living experiences they are having. So we have to be thoughtful to the realities of equity and inequity that's because it's always it's a it's a feature not a bug so i'm excited about the conversation before we get to the conversation we're going to go ahead and slide over to another episode of workplace democracy we haven't really like talked at length about how dope this segment is but as Tristan moves on to the Clarity Podcast, which is part of the Living Corporate Network. Make sure you give it five stars. I'm really excited about workplace democracy and the fact that it's a segment that gives you real, like now, again, for the sake of uh, liability, this is not legal advice, but it gives you real perspective from uh, someone who is an employment lawyer who has a background in EEOC. So you think about navigating, understanding your rights and navigating the workplace in different scenarios. This is critical for you. And this content will be available on living-corporate.com. So make sure you subscribe, create a profile, and you can have access to the entire library. You know what I'm saying? Now, all that being said, we're going to switch over, have our interview, and then we'll be back. All right. All right. When you're building a culture of belonging, every word counts. That's why Textio brings the world's most advanced language insights into your hiring and employer brand content. Our industry-leading approach to artificial intelligence and machine learning provides the tools needed to find more diverse candidates. In short, Textio builds more equitable workspaces, guiding businesses and writing more inclusive job posts. And we're building on that success by bringing even more products to the market for all people who share our belief that language matters. Words have power. And at Textio, we harness that power to increase the access and availability of value-driven work for everyone. Live in Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity is committed to fostering an inclusive and diverse work environment where differences are valued, practices are equitable, and employees experience a sense of belonging that allows them to bring their full, authentic selves daily. As medicine's largest network, there's an elevated level of responsibility to everything we do. 
We don't take that responsibility lightly and are committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. So if you want to learn more about Doximity, go to your app store and type in D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Again, that's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Welcome back to the Workplace Democracy Podcast segment brought to you by the Living Corporate Network. I'm your host, Tyra Robinson, an attorney licensed to practice in the state of Maryland. Thanks so much for tuning in again to the podcast segment that informs you about strategies to protect your rights as a professional employee. During this segment, we're going to talk about workplace retaliation. Retaliation occurs when a manager fires, harasses, or takes an action against an employee or other individual because the employee filed a complaint of discrimination participated in a discrimination proceeding, or otherwise opposed unlawful discrimination in general. So how do you prove retaliation? Well, many employment laws prohibit retaliation. The specific elements that an employee must prove are stated in those laws, but in general, the standard for proving retaliation requires showing that the manager's action could discourage a reasonable person from opposing discrimination or participating in the EEOC complaint process. It's important to know about protections against retaliation in the workplace because it is the most frequently filed type of charge with the EEOC. In fiscal year 2021, there are 34,332 retaliation charges filed. To protect yourself as an employee, you should diligently document any changes in your workplace affecting you, including the dates, explanation of the events, and who is involved. Thanks again for listening to Workplace Democracy, brought to you by the Living Corporate Network and myself, Tyra Robinson. I hope you'll tune in every segment to learn more about how to bring democracy to your workplace. Please understand that this podcast is only intended for educational purposes and is not a replacement for individualized legal advice. You should always seek the services of a licensed attorney who will look at the specific facts of your individual circumstance if you are considering legal action. Additionally, the views expressed in this podcast segment are my own and are not reflective of my employer. Living Corporate is brought to you by Textio. Today's top talent is everywhere, representing everyone. And our work environment should reflect the level of inclusion to meet that standard. Textio achieves this in building more equitable company cultures through the language we use in our job postings. That culture is formed one hire at a time, making the words we use to reach more diverse candidates all the more important. Our advanced language insights and employer brand content is what drives our mission of inclusion. Through our industry-leading application of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we're able to widen companies' reach in finding and building upon the very diverse talent that empowers a culture of belonging. Every door should be open to every qualified job seeker. Again, that's Textio. Living Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Over 90% of graduating medical students join Doximity to use our tools before earning their doctoral degree. As medicine's largest network, there's an elevated level of responsibility to everything we do. We don't take that responsibility lightly and are committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. If you want to learn more about Doximity, make sure you go to your app store, type in D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. That's D-O-X-I-M. I-T-Y. All right. Awesome. So I'm so excited, everyone, today. We have a fantastic show that will be taking place. I'm super excited. We have so much to discuss and to dive into for you all to be super enlightened. We'll be discussing design justice. And in that, we have the right person. She's certified <laughs> to discuss with us design justice today and so much more. So let me introduce our guest. Our guest is the founder and president of Boathouse Inc. Washington Disease Office. She brings 27 years as an award-winning business owner and executive specializing in design research, strategic planning, and marketing. She works directly with leaders and critical stakeholders on internal strategy, design, marketing, branding, and national advertising campaigns. In addition, she is working on her Doctor of Design at NC 
CTSU focus on design research, design justice, and human-centered service design. For 15 years, she bought, she taught both undergraduate and graduate level certification students at the George Washington University, American Public University, New School of Architecture and Design, and Coppin State. From 2012 to 2021, she co-hosted and produced a live weekly radio show focused on design and business innovation called Behind the Radio Show on We At Radio Network. She turned her BA in political science from Howard University, shout out to Howard, MTA in event management from the George University, from George Washington University, and an MA in design management from Savannah College of Art and Design. She is co-founder and board president of a 10-year nonprofit organization, Social Art and Culture. In addition, she's a member of Chief AIGA, Advisory Cloud, Epic, and Creativity Coaching Association. When I told you she's certified, I know y'all feel me now, right? <laughs> she's certified in this session today, right? So let's welcome Karen Baker to the show. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. How are you? I am great. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. This is cool. Always great to talk about design. Always, always. Yes, it, it, it's, an, it's a time yeah. for it, right? It's a time for Absolutely. So listen, I gave this wonderful introduction, but we know introductions are not all inclusive, right? So what would you like to share with our listeners, a more in-depth version of who is Karen Baker? You know, that's a great question, because um, like you said, you just read bios, you know, at the end of the day, you really don't know who the people are. First, I am a mother of a wonderful uh, son who will be 13 very soon, and actually today he graduates from the sixth grade, so I'm even more proud today. Uh, I said, this is congratulations. Thank you. Yes, congratulations. One of many graduations is the way that I look at it um, as well, too, and he yes. will be sporting a proud stole from Howard University. Whether he goes or not, he still will be strong. Honorary. Honorary, right? We're going right. right. we to we speak it, 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 you know, either way. So, yes. you know, and then I'm also, you know, I, I would say an artist, uh, artist and activist as well, too. I'm big on supporting artists in the creative economy, uh, making sure that their voice is heard, making sure that they in a place to be paid what they're worth. Um, you know, and, and and it was it was later in discovery for me of understanding being a designer, you know, because a lot of times we use the word designer, people think graphic. So they only think the end user, they only think the aesthetic part of it, but really design as a practice. You know, we, we come to the table as designers with so many ideas and, and bringing creativity and, you know, and, and what has fostered out of understanding design practice is that we also are there to solve a problem. You know, so I'm I'm a big advocate for designers being at the table from the very beginning. I'm, you know, I've been writing a lot about that seat at the table, us being there in the beginning of the conversation, bringing ideas. It's, it's how the table becomes diverse, you know, and it's thought and it's thinking. When you put a creative person at the table who's not just thinking only logic or logistics, you, you widen the pool. You, you really widen the opportunity to really be innovative. So... You know, I, I definitely see myself as an artist, an activist, a designer, you know, in the space of, of professionally, but it also moves into personally, you know, you, you it's, it's very hard to be an activist and that life not be personally part of who you are, as well as professionally. You can't cut it off, you know, when you mm -hmm. go home, if you're fighting for social justice or disability justice or restorative justice, criminal justice, you don't walk in your door, your home and then stop. You know, you continue to fight those things personally. So they are embedded within who I am as well, too. Yes, yes, that is good. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's definitely a part of who you are because that's where the passion Correct. comes from, right? Correct. That's where the motivation is, your why. Correct. So it, it runs deeper than, you know, your day to day. It's essentially who yes. you are. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly yeah. on that. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier about Boathouse, your nonprofit, Social Art and Culture. Uh, talk to us a little bit about Boathouse and Social Art and Culture. Like where the concept come from, more about it, how to start, what do you guys do? So Boathouse is, um, actually March began its 22nd year. Uh, it was founded mm. uh, by two gentlemen who have become, I'd say my partners in crime. Uh, John Connors and Chris Bolin, um, just really good people who believe in people, um, believe in uh, just high quality of service, 
uh, are high performers and I, I truly believe we have a team that is reflective of their leadership and now inclusive of my leadership as well too. So we, we would definitely say we are a marketing and tech firm. Um, we, we root real hard into advertising, but we take on people who, we, we talk about art and activism, we talk about people who are really social impact, who are really trying to impact community in some way. Um, and if they're not, we bring that in. So we have really been pushing narrative. And it's very interesting. I was watching the um, U.S. trials, really, and I, they like trials, for the Jan January 6th. And I was like, within a 10-minute time, the word narrative is mentioned. Your narrative, your narrative, your narrative. So, you know, we've been looking at narrative design and narrative strategy and really how do you tell your story so that it's impactful and it's going to impact the people that you serve. Not just I hear it and, oh, I'm drawn to it, but I hear it and then it gets itself into practice um, in that particular way. So we've been spending a lot of time during my, my inception into the company really trying to use that as a means to uh, really make a mark you know, for the clients that we serve as, as well too. So both houses based out of Boston, they were looking for someone to really grow the company and, you know, didn't really, it wasn't about where the person was, it was about who the person was. And so me being here in Washington, DC, I've been here over 30 years. So I have a very strong network here, uh, was a place that was chosen. So I've been growing the network here in DC but also wanting to make the organization more national. It's been very Massachusetts and New England based and it's client based and wanting to, be, but you know, when I came in, I was like, this work is really great work. People need to know the work of this company. You know, it's very rare that you find a marketing tech agency who wants to be academic, who wants to understand levels of research, who wants to do case studies, and then wants to make social impact. You know, I was like, people got to know this work, you know, so I'm there to also create that national voice to really push it up and make sure people know the importance and the difference of the work that Boathouse does. Um, and then social art and culture was, uh, you talk about passion, it was, it, it was passion. You know, um, we saw a gap where artists were, who were activists. So people weren't talking about saying artivism, they weren't saying social good, they weren't saying things like that 12 years ago. Um, and we saw this gap of these artists who their work is purposeful and it's meaningful that when they paint a mural, it's because they're trying to change and beautify a, 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 a block. And, you know, they're, they're doing things in that regard. So we were like, how can we support them? How can we be this this bridge to ensure that they have opportunity? You know, not only in how they are uh, financially supported, but that they have opportunity their work to be seen more and then the opportunity to be trained. Um, and so a, a lot of the work and a lot of the people who are part of social art and culture who supported our African-American artists uh, who are in, in the district or Maryland or Virginia who have been for decades doing this level of work, you know, whether standing on the street in a protest you know, and that's how they express their art, you know, um, their poets. It just runs the game. But, you know, we, we try to make sure that we bring to the table the ability to, for professional development. And then we also do something called the Creative Entrepreneur Capital Summit, where we take venture capitalist principles and push them into the creative economy. So we train people to understand how do you get an investor um, for your work? And it's so interesting because now we're talking about NFTs you know, that come about, you know, to be able to have someone say, oh, my work is now worth a million dollars, you know, when before that wasn't the, wasn't the case. So I always see social art and culture as being a little ahead of thought, you know, trying to forecast a better future um, for artists as well, too. And then the last thing we do is a Black Love Festival. Well, we, we celebrate blackness. That's what we do. Um, so, you know, we bring a festival of 10,000 or more people here um, from all over. Um, to really celebrate and make people honor and cherish the, you know, what, what, what black culture brings to, I would say, America. Yeah. Yes, that's so good. And, and the time you guys are listening, this may be a little bit after, but uh, coming this around time of Juneteenth, I'm yes. all, all for it. And, you know, what I love about um, when I think about social art and culture, it seems as though it's very forward thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not just for the now. And it seems like it's more so creating more of a well-rounded artist, Good. giving yeah. them everything they need to be successful. Not 
away from who they are, but adding more, so I'm pouring more into them. Um, I think that's like extremely amazing. And Boathouse, the narrative, yeah. that's definitely yeah. huge. Because you can tell your story, but how impactful is your right. story? Yes, it may resonate with me, but does it spark change yeah. in me? The action that follows the story part, right? right? And I think that's so so critical for when we're when we're telling our story. Because I think one of the <laughs> one of the hardest questions, you know, even for myself and for others and peers that I've heard is, you know, tell me about yourself. Yeah. It's always kind of hard to think about you, but I always say no one knows you better than yeah. you. But again, you have to know yourself, right, right, to be able to share That's that. That's right. Absolutely. Ac- completely accurate. So, <laughs> yes. yes. And listen, she, she's she been doing a lot of speaking, right? So she's good. She's good at this. <laughs> She's good at this, okay? And even here, she's running this podcast today, okay? It is the Karen Takeover. Uh, <laughs> you co-host and produce a live weekly radio show. I don't see how you even have time to even do this, okay? Because you have a lot of moving parts, yeah. right? On top of your son's graduation coming up and, and, and keeping him on the right yeah. path. Could you provide with us more details about Behind the Mind Radio, which I think the name Tell me about the name. How you come up with the name? And then how did you guys come up with the name? And then tell me more about Behind the Radio, Behind the Mind Radio. You know, Behind the Mind, I was coming out of graduate school from Savannah College of Art and Design and Design Thinking. And I was like, you know, uh, really, it was how do I jump straight into this marketplace and be an expert? And at the time, We Act Radio was launching here in Washington, D.C. And they are uh, they have syndicated programs as well as a local arm to the to the to the radio station um and it, if you ever come to dc they they premised the radio station to be in the community like the radio station wasn't do the right thing so you can it's a glass window you can look in you can see us on the station and there was, again you really wanted to be impactful in the community so when they they were about a year in and i was asked you know do you want a radio show what are you thinking i was like it, I got to think about what it's going to be because it's got to be good. It's like, if I'm going to do radio, it's got to be good. And I always saw myself doing radio at some point in my career. I was like, it's got to be good. So, we, you know, I started searching around and one of my uh, classmates who graduated with me, Anthony, I, you know, I was like, okay, what do you think, you know, about doing a show on design thinking? We started looking, there was nothing on design thinking. It was, there were no shows at that time. Um, nationally syndicated, nothing that was around in subject matter. So I said, I think this is our opportunity to give this community a chance to have a voice on radio because most times design thinkers, they are behind the scenes. They're, they're cultivating, they're ideating, they're bringing things to life. You may find out who actually brought you that amazing toy that you now know. You know what I'm saying? But they just don't have the uh, the platform to do it. I said, so we're going to provide them with the platform to be able to do it. And it gives us a chance to use what we know to be in the in this space. And that's how Behind the Mind came about. We were like, and it was trying to come up with a name, you know. And the founder of We Act Radio, he's the one I was tossing around a bunch of names. And that was one. He was like, that's it. He's like, it's easy to say. It makes sense. You're going to be diving into a subject matter that people have no awareness of. And actually, you're going to be diving into the mind of this designer, you know. And so we we, we birthed that show and ran it every single Friday <laughs> live for one hour. And we were determined. I was like, it has to be radio. It has to be live. You know, we have to be able to get the reaction from the people in real time. And um, mm-hmm. this was an amazing experience in my career. Absolutely. Just an amazing experience. So, yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you took that time for the experience. And, and like you said, capturing it in real life time, that captures the true essence of what's taking place, yeah. right? There's, there's yeah. no prescript. Like, you know, it's, it's live, it's raw, it's real. Yeah. And I think that's definitely something that uh, radio definitely definitely needs is think, keeping things very much authentic. Yeah, very true. Very um, true. So, Let's take a deeper dive mm-hmm. here into your okay. mind, and your right. thoughts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about, um, you know, since the murder of George Floyd in 2021, excuse me, in 2020, mm-hmm. there have been, um, there's been an uptick in organization marketing mm-hmm. of black and brown mm-hmm. faces. So we know that history can be very cyclical, mm-hmm. right? It's just constant roast. Mm-hmm. Same thing over and over and over mm-hmm. again. Have you seen this before? 
where there has been an uptick in organization marketing of black and brown faces after a very traumatic event oh, yeah. that has impacted Oh, yeah. Our- this isn't anything new. Um, and even I was talking to someone who uh, is what we used to call the baby boomer generation, I guess you would say. Mm-hmm. And she was like, you know, history repeats itself. She said, I saw this during my time. She was like, and the thing about it, it will go and then it will come again. Um, and so we, we saw it, you know, earlier, like, like I would tell people, like the Black Lives Matter movement didn't start with George Floyd, you know, it started before then, it got a, a heightened awareness and support during that time period, but they started making noise when we had Tray, Tray on Mark, Trayvon Martin start, you know, they, they started to really shape themselves during that time period to be able to, um, let people know that there was an issue, you know, that was going on. And, and, and those issues started to grab national attention. You know, um, when I was at Howard University, you know, that's when I really learned to protest. You know, that, that was the time that we, we took over the university in protest of, of Lee Atwater at that time sitting on our board um, and was able to change and impact that. So there are movements uh, when you talk about in civil and social that will always occur. The thing about it, I think, that we saw in 2020 is the pouring in financially and the large calling out that had not normally occurred, you know. Um, But what we're seeing now is, or, or, or the call out now, are the amount of organizations that said it but didn't follow through. And that percentage is extreme. I mean, it's it's huge. So people are doing the work to find out, okay, you said this in 2020, 2021, and what we're finding out is the organizations that you pledged to never received the funds. So those are the things that are going on and that are being called out right now have to be called out. It definitely has to be called out. Um, And it's something I was actually discussing a time uh, with a few friends or colleagues, however, is when this took place, um, George Floyd and the organization okay. saying like, hey, mm-hmm. we're going to donate, you know, X number of funds. And like you're saying, it, it being allowed right. impact financially. Uh, it, it seems as if yeah. though that was a time where yeah. we're doing it now because yeah. it's trending, yeah. it's popular. Yeah. But here we are two years in. Where is the where are the funds that you said that you want to donate, right? Yeah. And then where is that uh, that action piece? We're having the conversations, but what are we Mm. doing about it, right? Um, I think that's definitely something that now they're being called out. A lot of organizations are being called out for action in that financial piece. And does it still matter to you? Do those black and brown faces still matter after, right? Um, So what are some equitable, equitable ways to market black and brown phrases that drive revenue? You know, that's a good question. I think that, and, and this is where we'll, we'll deal with design as a practice. This, the first thing I think people have to do is ask these communities what they need, okay? And not assume that what you're giving is enough, that what you're giving is going to provide the value that it needs to bring. So you got to ask, what is the need within this community? And as, 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 as we know, because we're both black women sitting here, that where you are and where I am, the need may be a little different, yes. you know? And so the need then becomes geographical um, on things that are also needed as well, too. But then the other thing is people got to understand what equity means, Um, you know, and, and I don't know that everybody understands what equity means. It is across the board that things are going to be accessible to me as they are accessible to you. And that's not always what them, it, 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 people look at it like, okay, I can give you a little more, but that don't mean I want you to be equal. (laughs) So you, you really have to do a deep dive into what that word means and can you really supply it? And then what, if you can't supply it all, which I understand, how are you going to contribute towards it being more equitable? You know, and that's probably the first thing is you got to ask, you got to understand what it means because with equity, then there becomes integration. 
So then when I tell you that I'm going to now make things equal, uh, equal playing field, then I got to integrate you into that playing field, you know, and then that's not easy, you know, because you got to make sure that everybody on that playing field is now acceptable. They're accepting the fact that I'm walking in the room when they've never seen me walk in their room. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to have you in the room. And I'm going to make you comfortable within that room as well, too. That's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. But it could be done. It's You know, like you say, it's hard, but it's doable. It's hard, yeah, doable. it's doable. And when that person walks into that room, making sure everyone is on the same accord and we all have mm -hmm. the same tools, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to work mm -hmm. twice as hard to be half as good. It should be a space That's where right. I feel comfortable, like most organizations are saying, bringing my whole self to work, right? Bring all of you. That's right. I should be able That's to right. do that. And sometimes I think yeah. uh, organizations aren't as mindful of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. always that glass ceiling there, like this is as far as we will allow you to go and as far Correct. as we, we would do that. But you're not really addressing what my need is. You're speaking to what Correct. you think I should have yeah. to be just to have just yeah. enough uh y'all yeah. done i think that's uh that's that's sad it's really really sad and i, I really wish it is i mean in the, the end of the day because it's, you gotta stop and take the time to to to, to learn mm -hmm. to have the awareness and you know and even when when there, there's something called ethnography you know in in design and it requires uh, a designer to sit amongst a community and observe and it's to let the community tell you who they are. Now, ethnography, people will be in ethnography sometimes for a year. Yeah. Um, you know, th there's, there's such thing as rapid ethnography too, where you may do like a month, but the most of his history is that year type of time frame, six, eight months, a year that you're sitting in the community. I've met people who are doing work for organizations and they've been, they've lived with a family mm -hmm. in another country for six to eight months, trying to understand that culture completely to be able to design something that is equitable, that integrates them in that they feel a part of in doing that. See, and that's what my point with that is most people don't want to take that time. They don't want to take that time. They want to do a little couple workshops Everybody going to walk away and they going to, I now understand it. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like no, that. No, you don't. Like you definitely got to submerge yourself in it and become selfless, right? Submerge yourself in it and take, yeah. it, take it all on. But I think with that, you know, so I'm in Jacksonville, Florida, right? Um, okay. Okay. And there are certain areas that some people may not uh, favor as much. And when you speak to certain individuals, you know, there's a lot of crime that takes place here. But that's not the Jacksonville they know. So I'm saying that for many of the organizations, when we think about making things equitable for black and, black and brown faces, that may not be a part of the organization that they know. That's not their world. That's not what exists to them. It's all rainbow skittles, unicorns, hopping over, <laughs> hopping over lilies. Like it's not their world. So what does design justice look like in Web3? And for some of our listeners, they may not know exactly what is Web3 or what is design justice. So if you can break down and define what that is and then elaborate for us, what does it look like in Web3? Sure. So um, Web3 is really when we talk about these NFTs, which is, uh, again, when we talk about uh, certain communities not having an awareness of what N N NFTs are. We talk about cryptocurrency. Um, that's that's what Web3, when you talk about this heightened thing of gamification, um, that ends up being Web3 as well, too. Uh, the whole thing of monetization uh, within the Internet is Web3. Um, I sat on the webinar maybe a couple days ago, and uh, the person was saying that uh, one of the things that, she's, that has been contemplating on is whether it should be called Web2.5 and not 3.0 because it's still in this such early stages of it and again there's not awareness of everybody understanding like we know the internet right you know we know what the internet is which is the the 2.0 for those who don't know we know that part you know and but if we think about that there's still lack of accessibility to certain communities to the internet so design justice is 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 really looking at design from a social justice lens across the board 
not not just Web3 metaverse. Really looking at bias, looking at the systematic racism um, around and how design can play a part in changing that that narrative. So when again, when I talked about design as a practice, it's, it's this charge to designers to design from a just space, to j- design from the space of understanding that you're designing, looking at the lens of marginalized communities, underserved communities being left out of whatever you are about to sit at, sit down and design. So you're putting that hat on from the very beginning to think about what am I putting out and who am I leaving out and what I'm actually designing. So that's what Design Justice. So the Design Justice Network was started uh, around 2015, but it was formalized. Like they created their principles and this membership, which I'm a part of during 2020, because again, we just talked about this heightened situation that, that came up um, and more national attention and international attention that came around George Floyd. So with design justice um, and, and let's say digital, the digital space. Um, so the metaverse uh, is, if you think about um, virtual reality, putting on the VR glasses and being feeling like you're in the space, is, is that heightened gamification? Of, of, of reality. The thing about the metaverse, though, is they're trying to match the present with the alternate, the alternate reality. So they're trying to make sure that the things that you see in your present, you'll see in the metaverse. So you'll be able to shop. You'll be able to potentially do real estate in the metaverse. They're looking at pushing it that far. So when you look at, let's just say, a movie where people put it on, and it, 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 um, I think it was Ready One. Steven Spielberg did a movie called Ready One. And they were hopping between the present and the future. But they were physically coming into the present. The world wasn't changing in the present. And then they put on the glasses, and they'd be a, a avatar in the, in the future. So it's kind of along that lines when you think about it with a greater, greater push with it as well, too. So what I have looked at, and I was like, you know, There was a woman who wrote an article that said, I'm a black woman and I'm afraid of the metaverse. Okay. That article was sent to me uh, by a friend of mine. When I read it, she noted the design justice. And there's all these things around the metaverse that were uncertain, that were costly, that were uh, exclusive from uh, her as a black woman. And I was like, you know, this is something that we, I need to really pay attention to. Um, and so I did. And, you know, I started really digging. And when I found out and started being part of the Design Justice Network, I said, how can these principles apply to the metaverse? So, you know, I'm, I'm really on a mission to, to say to designers that if you are in technology and development, you need to start designing in the metaverse anything technology-based, gamification-based, understanding that for historically, marginalized communities have been left out of the tech world. Right. We know that even as creators. So if you're designing for the metaverse, how are you beginning to think about, let me not leave X, Y, Z walking on the street here in Washington, D.C., who has no clue about the metaverse. How can I make sure that he has some level of exposure to it? The exposure, I think, is definitely, definitely key and keeping us on the forefront of their minds. Yeah. Individuals, keep us on the forefront of your minds when you create. When you're having that moment to create Correct. and to think that through and put it all together, that we're also being included. The inclusivity is, I think, extremely important because, y'all, before this, I didn't even know what the metaverse is. I had to get on there and read. I'm reading the articles. I'm not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, and it's an ongoing search. You're going to be searching for yes. a while because it's so early in, in, in its stage. But again, search. You know what I'm saying? Look it up. Know what it is because. It's, it's, it's going to happen. Please believe it's going to happen. Right now, the prediction of the amount of money that the metaverse will bring from an economic standpoint is in the trillions. Wow. Do you think people are going to let that not happen? No way. No way. No way. When no it comes way. to money, we make so it happen, y'all. Oh we yeah, it absolutely. It te- we know technology is money. You know what I'm saying? We don't technolo- technological developments bring revenue. Yes, they do. So. If you are thinking about being in technology, you know, it, it is a place you want to go. But what we have to start to see 
is more people who are black, brown, indigenous, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American, whichever you fit in that category, moving towards being trained yeah. and being having a seat at the table in development. Because if we don't, well, again, that's what I've been saying, those same systematic problems that we have right now will carry over, and particularly because we don't fix them now. Yeah, we definitely have to fix them now when they're, you know, when they're sitting in the room and the rooms and at the table having these conversations and having these forward thoughts and thinking out these plans and these ideas and these projects, they can only see beyond really just themselves. You know, right. most times right. we're not a part of mine because we're not exactly all included within their world. So having right. as many black and brown faces sitting at the table to keep us mm -hmm in the picture to keep us in the loop, mm -hmm. I think will make a huge difference. We need more more of us in tech, definitely. And, and I think there oh, is yeah. their influx of us going into tech that I've seen here over the past couple of years. You know, we meet people, yeah. we're like, oh, wow, you know, you're you're doing tech. That's, it seems a little different um, for most of us because mm -hmm. we're taught, you know, healthcare. Yeah, education. It's, it's not mm -hmm. that, that much. Yeah of diversity yeah. when we think about that when we move into those different spaces. So mm -hmm. speaking about like being at the table in these rooms, if you were to mm -hmm. present to like a small group of chief marketing officers, what would be mm -hmm. your three points of advice to give for more equitable and inclusive teams? That's a good question. I think the first thing I would ask them to ask themselves, um, are we included? So if, if, if you're sitting there in that table and you and I don't look the same, whatever that may be, am I included? Are you included? Are you included? Are you included in, in the marketing that I'm putting out? The next is probably really understanding who your audience is. You know, people make a lot of assumptions. And I always tell this story, um, Shanisha, when there was a company that was doing the marketing for uh, St. Joseph Aspirin, right? St. Joseph had found out that more than 50% of the people that were buying their products were African-American men over the age of 55. Now, you know St. Joseph is an old aspirin, and they knew. They were not doing any market research and let me just say, even research, even design research, because market research, you do secondhand design research to find out who their audience was. So this, this was a surprise to them. This was like shocking. So they rushing to find a marketing company to serve an audience that has been supplying them with revenue for quite some time. The problem is they didn't even know the wow. audience. They had no clue what they liked, what they wanted. They didn't have any clue of who they were. So they rushed to this agency. The agency that I was dealing with got a call. We sat down. We were telling them because a lot of the men on my team were black men heading towards that age. Where would we go to serve them? Where would we activate in spaces to give them what they need? But when, I, when we got that call, I was just like, wow. So again, do you know who your audience is? Are you, you know, because again, you can get so far in the work that you fit, get to go back and do the research to see if things have changed, you know? So you really know if the things have changed. The other thing is your team. Wh who's on your team? Is do you have a team that is reflective of a balance of what the world is right now? Are, are you providing leadership opportunities to those who would be black, brown, indigenous, age specific. Do you have the opportunity, are you affording them the opportunities to be at the table within your team as a CMO? Because then you don't, I, I, right then and there, if I look at your team and everybody looks the same, there's no way that you all are being innovative. There's no way, there's no way. So don't even use the word in your description because you're not being that, because you're not providing that within your team to be able to produce information for the people that you serve, i.e. your clients. So yeah, that would be the three. Yeah, that's that's really good. Because when you do think about that, people of color, black or brown, in leadership, in those roles at the CMO, you don't necessarily see that right. very often. There's a very small percentage 
And most Correct. companies made their pledges of what they would like to see in years to come. And even those pledges right. is still a small percent. Black yeah. women in leadership, yeah. 10%. Yeah. You know, uh, like yeah. you said, white Pacific, 10%, 5%. Native yeah. American, 2%. Mm -hmm. It's not that much of an increase where you see that. Yeah. So when I'm sitting at the table and all you guys, everyone's the same. Like you said, there's no way that you can talk about diversity and you can really speak to the needs of those communities that you're yeah. looking to serve. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be. I don't, I don't know how you would. You can't. You I don't can't know see, how you, you can't. Would. You can't speak to it. There's no real, real clear understanding there. Because again, that's their work. That's this is your world. That's not the world that you Correct. live in. And if you have this, Correct. this product that whatever that you're marketing, you have to consider your audience. You have to consider the needs of those who you're serving. It, it, can't, Correct. it can't be out of your own of what you would like to see. And, you know, the thing is, is in, 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 even if we move past culture, mm -hmm. we have differences in education. You know what I'm saying? You 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 went to school to in, in a medical environment. You bring a different lens uh, on education. You live geographically somewhere different. You bring a lens that's different in that as well, too. You know, the beautiful thing about the pandemic, people started to hire globally. They no longer say, oh, they just got to live in Jacksonville, Florida, because they got to be able to get in his office. Now they can live everywhere. So here is another level of diversity that comes to the table. You know, that you have experiences where you live and how you've lived that are going to be brought to the table that are going to be, here's, here's another voice, you know. So that in itself also is, is a plus as well, too. You know, I think that's what the pandemic brought. When we talk about diversity and I also talk about a level of exploring more talent, it, it allowed people to do that because they said, oh, okay, everybody's not coming in the office. Okay, we got the great resignation going on. You know, um, now we can potentially hire someone in Florida when we're sitting in D.C. Or we could potentially hire someone in South Africa when we're sitting in D.C. You know, when that whole landscape of how we work, particularly in the United States, started to shift. Because other people were doing this before yeah. us. Um uh, you know, they, they were doing this uh, as well, particularly in uh, other countries that do a lot of mass production. Um, they were doing this already. So That's really good to know. That's really good to know. Lisa, you share a lot today. I told y'all, this is the Karen Baker takeover. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate you. Let me take it over. Yes. I know. I just know you guys have learned so much today. So much. And I mean, it's an ongoing conversation, an ongoing dialogue. It doesn't stop here. Um, Karen, are there any shout outs before we go? Um, You know, I, well, yeah, I say yes. And I, I love that you had that on the end of your question, though, as well, too. You know, I think I, I'll say shout out to Boathouse because also it's afforded me the opportunity to be able to start amplifying my voice um, even, even more. I mean, even for the audience that know, I owned a company for 27 years. And when they came to me, I put my company down to come here. So that's huge, that is, that is. you know. So it tells a lot about this organization for me to be able to do that and trust that they were going to take care of me um, as well. So definitely just shout out to them for wanting to continue to amplify my voice um, and make sure that people could hear more than just it, it, no rhetoric um, and know that I don't deliver that as well too. And then I think shout out to uh, Austin and Zena, who's been the PR team pushing us to make sure that we able to amplify our voice about the things that we are personally passionate about and then professionally passionate about. And thank you, Dr. White. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure having you in. Shout out to you. Shout out to Boathouse. And shout out to your son yes. for his graduation. Thank you. Amazing. The, the many of many, right? The many of many. And like I said, guys, this is the ongoing conversation. It does not stop here. Um, it was a pleasure having Karen here on the show. And, you know, that's our show. So thank you all for joining us on Living Corporate Podcast. Be sure to follow Karen. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Living Corporate, Twitter at Living Corp underscore pod, and subscribe to our newsletter. Listen, we want to hear to y'all. 
I know you guys can have those Twitter That's fingers, right. but we want we want some letters. Feel free to type us and write to us and send it to uh, www.living-corporate.com. If you have any questions you'd like for us to answer on the show, uh, make sure you email them to us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. This has been Shanisha, and you have yeah, great thing. Um, so we're and the Karen, email, go, how the can people website, contact sorry, you? Is boldhousegroupinc.com. So they can always go there uh, and find me there. And then I kind of stay. I like Twitter is my thing. So you can find me on Twitter as well, too, um, underneath my name, Karen Baker. So, yeah, this is great. I appreciate you for sure. Yes, absolutely. So, again, you guys have been listening to Karen Baker. (laughs) It's Shanisha. This is her takeover. It's definitely her takeover. It was a pleasure having you. And that's our show. Peace. Thank you so much. And we are back. Remember, in a capitalist society, inequity, injustice, disinclusion are features. They are not bugs. And that means irrespective of that title that you may have, we should be looking to create more equitable worlds and spaces and experiences at work. We should be looking to dismantle systems that are naturally oppressive. We should be looking to amplify and center historically marginalized and oppressed voices. We should be looking to redistribute power for those who are continuously and have been historically harmed. Okay. That's important. And that work, that work is not about looking cute or being recognized or being on a list or whatever. It's real, 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 real work. It's real work. It's not about having a spicy post on LinkedIn or being controversial or selling a bunch of books. It's about doing something um, that's going to be transformational for organizations so that people can have a better experience in the places that they work because we have to work to survive. That's the way this system is set up, right? So I just really want to emphasize that, right? Like, I'm not really sure. And you, we, we, if you've been listening to Living Corporate for any period of time, you know that we talk about like the future of this space and the future of this work and like what's HR's relationship with diversity, equity, inclusion. What does the diversity, equity, inclusion practitioner need to be looking at and transitioning to in the next few years? What's the rest of this decade look like? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that inequity and disinclusion are not going to magically go away irrespective of the next big capitalist trend. It's just not. It's going to take people willing to do the work. And the work is more than being seen or talking on social media. The work involves change management, communications, leadership development, stakeholder management skills, enterprise engagement strategies. It involves go-to-market strategies and, and connecting your business priorities with your actual people strategy. It involves having incredibly uncomfortable data-driven conversations to hold leaders accountable. It's so much, but all those things I just said are tangible things that are hard and complex to do. Right. And we need everybody who is able and who cares about an equitable future of work to be doing that work. All right. Till next time, y'all, this has been Zach. Catch you soon. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.